All right, let's get started. Um, first thing I have to do is apologize to you. Um, I spent the last, uh, what, two or three days in Orlando, Florida, so I'm sorry I didn't bring the weather back with me. Um, I got off of the plane and I went, it's not Orlando, because <laughs> it was cold. Um, I, I wanted to go through a few quick announcements and then we'll take a, a, a moment and, uh, and just sort of kept, like, catch up a little bit, make sure we're all on the same page, and then we will get into uh, the wonderful world uh, of steel design. Particularly today we're going to talk about shear lag factors, slenderness limits, which only takes about a minute to discuss, and then we're going to go through some full-blown analysis examples, which will uh, really start to get us, you know, hitting the ground running on, on design. Um, so quick announcements. Um, you might have received an email recently. Uh, if not, you, you might have mentioned or received one before on there's this uh, video featurette competition that site is, is uh, conducting right now. They really want uh, students to just sort of like make a little, short little video about, um, you know, what they're doing in engineering, you know, what they enjoy and all that. There's a whole bunch of details. There's, there's money involved with it too. You know, they're going to judge them and then like the first place prize wins 100 bucks and then second place wins 75 and third place wins 50. So, I mean, like, I don't know about you. I like money. I don't, I don't know about you. So, and there's plenty of time. It's not due till February 28th. So, if you're interested, I mean, you know, go for it. Um, homework two is going to be assigned today. Homework two is going to be on analysis of tension members. So, things like gross and net area and then some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today and uh, next time. It'll be due on Monday, February the 6th. So, there's plenty of time to, uh, to do that. I'll pass that out. Um, before uh, end of business today. Um, let me go ahead and get the sign-in sheet started. All right, any questions? All right, okay, so let's sort of get back into the swing of things and, um, okay, let's get back into the swing of things and make sure we're clear on what's going on. And I think I'll, oh, that didn't work. Go back to, that's where I wanted. There we go. All right. So let's get back to this. I think this is a nice place to sort of pick up because um, it's been a while since we've met. So um, all in all, I really want to ensure that so far you know, in talking about our, our tension member analyses, I think we've settled on that. You know, gr uh, net area equals the gross area where, uh, where we subtract um, any uh, area loss due to the presence of bolts, but we add any uh, stagger factors to account for diagonal failure paths. And we've done, I think, a fair number of examples to assess not only parallel or grid-like bolt patterns, but staggered bolt patterns uh, like this. So I want to take a moment, um, no pun intended, because we're talking about tension members and there's no moment. <laughs> All right, I want to uh, just take some time and make sure that everybody's fine with this. Did anybody have it? <laughs> <laughs> did, did, <laughs> did, 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 uh, does anybody have any questions about, um, about just some of the stuff we did before, about net area, about stagger pass, anything like that? Because you're going to have some practice on your homework, so I really want to make sure that this makes sense. Everybody good with this? Okay, all right. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get into what I would argue is the other complication regarding um, uh, tension members, and that's shear lag. Um, we've talked about net area, I think, till we're all blue in the face, and, and I think it's time to get into a, to shear lag. If you understand net area and you understand shear lag, then tension member analysis and design will be pretty straightforward. So um, the idea behind accounting for shear lag really revolves around connections that are a lot like this. So we have a, a, a wide flange section, and it, you can see it's got uh, bolted connections and it's connected via the flanges. So we've got a, a series of bolts here. We've got a series of bolts here. So pop quiz, um, how many lines of bolts on each flange? Two. Remember, two lines of five bolts, just to ensure we're all remembering the terminology and everything. All right. So we've got, um, we've got this W section connected by flanges, but there's nothing going on in the web, right? No bolts in the web, okay? So ultimately what's going to happen is, is that's going to affect the way that the connection performs 
as it's being loaded. Um, what's going to happen is something like this. And, and I, I argue that one of the easiest ways to describe it is to imagine you've got a really serene, nice, even creek flowing. You know, you know, it's all symmetric. You know, everything's, you know, the banks are at a one to two slope. Everything's nice and serene. You've got a nice, calm, you know, stream of water flowing through it. And then you take a big boulder and set it right in the middle of the creek. Now, right there at that boulder, the water's going to be splashing and splashing and going all over the place. So the, the flow of the water right around that boulder is going to be quite disturbed, right? Now, down the way, you know, down the creek a little bit, once the effect of that boulder has been somewhat negated, everything's going to go back to nice, cool, calm, even flow, right? Make sense? Well, the same thing is, is happening in a bolted connection. You know, when we look at the gross section, you know, gross section yielding, we're talking about out here where all the stresses are nice and, and uniform. What you're seeing here is an image of what's called a finite element analysis. This is looking at shear lag effects in, in tension members. And this contour, this sort of rainbow looking uh, image that you're seeing right here is a, a visual representation of the stresses that are occurring right there around that connection. And you can see right around where the bolts are, the stresses are sort of hopping around all over the place. Like, you know, we've got regions of very, very high stress, regions of very low stress. And it's just because the presence of a bolt introduces discontinuities in the stress field. It's just, it is what it is. It's, again, it goes back to the same thing of a, a boulder in a creek. You know, the water's going to be splashing all over the place. The problem is, when we look at gross section yielding, we can ignore that because we're looking down here where the stresses are all nice and uniform. We're not talking about gross section yielding, though, right here. We're talking about net section fracture. So we're, when we, you know, samurai sword or lightsaber through the section, we're talking about right here. We have to be able to account for those irregularities in the stress field, okay? Now, the reason why we call it shear lag, if you're curious, and I think I mentioned this last time, but if you've got something like a, let's say you've got an angle, okay? So here's the angle, so the L shape. And let's say one side's bolted and the other isn't. Well, when I yank on that angle, that load's going to be transmitted through the bolts. So part of the angle's going to see that load and part of it isn't. Because that part that isn't, you know, as I'm yanking on it, that one part's kind of lagging behind. It's really not seeing that load. And since that internal stress phenomenon's a lot like a shear uh, stress inside, we call that shear lag. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if you really want to start to, and I mean like analytically, uh, you know, hammer down towards the exact answer. I mean, this gets really tough in the world of mechanics. I mean, you either have to have some really complex computer modeling or you've really got to, you, know, uh, 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 you know, put your thinking cap on and get your, you know, uh, advanced mechanics and series solution, all that stuff out. You really got to do some really complex calculations to, to assess this, I would say, quote, unquote, exactly. But we're not going to do that for every single bolted connection that's out there. We'd like to use some more approximate methods that represent the phenomenon uh, as closely as possible. So uh, we do that through the use of what are called shear lag factors. So the first thing I want to do is I want everybody to open their, their manual to this. Now, see my little, little star tab there indicating that this is a table that you ought to tap. Now, if you're wondering where this is, anytime you see a 16.1, that again refers to this body of the spec back here. Remember, that's the code, and then the gray pages are the, the commentary. So 16.1, we're in chapter D. So if you remember, like 16.126, that was the beginning of chapter D. If you go to 16.1-28, you should see a full page that looks something about like this on the screen, table D3.1 shear lag factor, factors for connections to tension members. So, has everybody got that? So, just you, all right, all right, since I'm, I'm feeling, oh, there we go, there we go, since I'm feeling nice. Okay, all right, everybody found this? If you haven't already done so, it's probably not the worst idea in the world to go ahead and tab this. This is a really important section. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was too heavy to carry in, is that what it was? No, it was uh, 
That, that's not the worst reason in the world, I guess I'd say. <laughs> All right. Um, regardless of if you have the, uh, the, the, the manual or not, you probably will be able to read this off the slide. So I'm going to go through a, a few different cases to kind of explain what's going on. So the first case. Did you have a question? Oh, oh I, thought, I thought you did. Oh, no, you're fine. Okay. So let's go through case number one. So let's read this out. So all tension members where the tension load is transmitted directly to each of the cross-sectional elements by fasteners or welds. So what that means is if I was going back to this, um, uh, this connection, so the cross-sectional elements are things like the flanges and the web uh, and what have you. So this connection wouldn't comply with case one because I've got bolts along the flanges, but I don't have bolts along the web. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now this connection, this would comply, right? This is one we did last time, that example 3B. And this would comply because there's bolts along this leg and bolts along this leg. Okay? Now let me be clear, okay? When you introduce a bolt into a, a, a connection like this, you're going to have stress discontinuities. Okay? Let, let's be clear on that. What shear lag factors are trying to do, though, is they're trying to account for the inefficiency in the connection. You know, in other words, not connecting everything. And by and large, what's happening here with case one is case one is saying, well, you really have connected every element of the member. So, yeah, you're going to have some stress discontinuities, but in terms of uh, the math and in terms of design, close enough for government work, let's just take u to equal one. Okay? Does that make sense? So if you had something like, um, like this, this is a single plate, and that entire plate is connected by bolts or welds, this would be a case where u equals one. This is a case where u does not equal 1. So what do you do there? Well, let's read case 2. Case 2 says, all tension members except, you know, uh, plates and HSS, and there are some other uh, 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 listings for plates and HSS. Basically, what this is talking about here when it says plates and HSS is it's really referring to cases like case 4 where you have welds and whatnot. But if you go through this, it says all tension members where the tension load is transmitted to some, but not all of the cross-sectional elements, uh, we would use the following expression. So does everybody see where it says 1 minus x bar over L? That, that's where it says L. I know it looks like I or something like that, but, it, but it's L. Okay. Now, one thing I will point out is that when you go through this table, it is very possible that multiple cases shall apply. So, Mr. Atkins, do me a favor. What does case seven say? Case seven is. Just the first column, not, not all that other stuff. Uh, case seven is when you add up uh, HP shapes or HP shapes. Okay. And it, okay, so WMS or HP shapes. And if you go through the, uh, the second column, it'll start to talk about whether or not you have bolts in your flanges, right? Does everybody see that? So if you look for this particular section, you have, like if we're looking at what we have here on the screen, not only would we use case two, but we would also use case seven, okay? And here's what's going on. Case two really is sort of a one size fits all equation that by and large works for the majority uh, of bolted connections. But because you've got this one equation that's trying to capture a lot of complex effects and a lot of different connections, sometimes there's just better models than others. So, so the way the spec handles that is it says, well, case two will tend to work for just about anything. But if you've got a very particular type of connection, maybe something like this, why don't you also check case seven as well? Okay? Make sense? And those other cases are, are trying to represent those particular types of connections a, a little better. And as, in terms of which value you use, we'll go through that as we, we get into our uh, examples. So this is uh, one of the, uh, the more popular examples that you'll see, 1 minus x bar over L. Yes, sir? Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but look, 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 what, look what you're being connected to. One says flanges and one says webs, right? See? Yeah. Now, now here's the thing. Here's <laughs> hold on, hold on. 
<laughs> Marker drop. All right. Um, <laughs> um, let, let me also make a point. Let me also let me make a serious point though about that. You can have a connection that meets the requirements of K7. Maybe it doesn't meet the requirements of K7. And if it doesn't, just don't use K7. Just go back to, to case two. That, that, that's a good point. Okay. Make sense? All right. Now, the way I have case two written here is a little different, obviously, than the way it's written in the spec. I have X bar sub C O N and I have L sub C O N because those terms are related to the connection. Okay. So I really want to take these one at a time and make sure they make sense. So let's talk about X bar. X bar is defined as the connection eccentricity. Okay? So it's defined as the distance from the connected face of the member to wherever the centroid is. Okay? So sometimes you've got to use your bookkeeping skills when you go through the beginning part of the manual to make sure that you're looking up the right value. Now L is your connection length, and we'll talk about that in specifics as we, as we get to that. Let me handle X bar first, okay? Now, in most cases, you can just look it up. You know, you go to the beginning part of the manual where you got the W-shaped properties and you got the channel properties and all that, and you can just look it up. The big thing is to make sure you're using the right values. So, for instance, I'm going to steal this from you real quick. So, if I'm talking about, let's say, a channel, and I have a situation like this where I have a channel that's connected uh, using bolts that are connected through the web, okay? So I need the distance from the connected face of the member, the space out here, to the centroid. So I need this distance, the distance from the back of that channel to the centroid. Now, if I don't know what that value is, like, okay, I know what distance I need, but I need to know what it's called in the manual. Remember, if I open up the channel table, there's a nice little picture up here that tells me what's going on, right? Use that image, and if I look at this image, it tells me that the value I need is X bar. Okay, so I go to the table, and if I'm using a C15 by 50, I go over, and X bar is 0.799 inches. That's the value I'm going to use for the connection eccentricity. Does that make sense? So you just got to make sure that you're interpreting it uh, appropriately. Okay. Now for angles, if it's connected via the long leg, you'd use X bar, but it's connected by the short leg, you'd use Y bar. Okay. Now, it's just it's all about bookkeeping. And if they're equal legs, then you'll look at X bar and Y bar, and they're the same because it's, it, it's the same length. Okay. So just make sure that you're doing your bookkeeping and make sure you're assessing uh, what's going on. Sound good? Okay. Now, here's one that's a little unique. Okay. So what's happening in, in this? I'm actually going to go back a few slides, and then I'll hit this back up. If you look at going back to this particular uh, case, a W section connected via the flanges, this is a very, very common connection uh, for tensile elements. The way that we handle shear lag is when we say, all right, when I take this member and I kind of yank on it, would a fair way of looking at it be that about half that load goes to the upper part of the, the member and half that load goes to the lower part? Is that a fair way of looking at it? Make sense? Okay, well, when we have this particular situation right here, okay, the, uh, where we have a W section that is connected via the flanges, to get our connection eccentricity, instead of looking it up in the W section, or the W shapes, we look up the centroid from the equivalent WT. So, l l let me explain what I mean by equivalent WT. So, here's my original section, right? Okay, so original section. Samurai sword or lightsaber, I cut it in half, okay? Let's go back to this right here, W12 by 30. Remind me, what's the 12 mean? It's about how deep it is. It's nominal depth. What's the 30 mean? Pounds per foot, how heavy it is. So this is about how deep it is. This is about how heavy it is. Well, if I cut this thing in half, what's going to happen? The depth is going to get cut in half, right? And the weight's going to get cut in half. So here's what I would do. If I've got this particular set, this particular connection, and again, this is a unique snowflake. We're only talking about this particular type of connection. If I've got, a, let's say, a W12 by 30, I would go to the WT shapes, and I would find the WT6 uh, by 15, and then looking at the WT6 by 15, I would look up the centroid, which 
We're talking about this centroid up and down from this connected face to this centroid, so I would look up Y bar, okay? So if I've got a W12 by 30 connected via the flanges, what would the connection eccentricity be? Let's pop quiz everybody. 1.27. Let me see if I can. What's that? 1.27. That is correct. All right. No. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, if we're, if we're talking about a channel or an angle or something like that, you wouldn't do this. This is only for like I-shaped sections, like W-shapes, M-shapes, H-P-shapes, S-shapes, only those, okay? If you're dealing with a channel, you would just look up the centroid, you know, directly from the channel or something like that. They do. For every W, no, 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 that's a good question. For every W shape, there should be an equivalent WT. And there are, you know, like 15.5s. It, it should be listed. You see it? No, that's fine. That's fine. I mean. <laughs> so, yeah, find, find an equivalent shape. But if you just look through the WTs, you should see like 0.5s or something. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just remember, in design mode, the W14 by 800, it will work. It will always work. It won't be the most economical, but it will work. Okay. Sound good? Okay. That's the, the connection eccentricity. Here's the length. The length is literally the distance from uh, out to out from your bolts. So from, you know, the outermost bolt on the left to the outermost bolt on the right, whatever that length is, that's your connection length. And the idea is that the longer that connection length is, you know, the longer that length is, the more room those stresses have to permeate throughout the cross-section. Remember, when we samurai sword or lightsaber, we're doing that through the lead line, right? So for this upper connection that's right here, for this lower connection right here, you know, the one that's all the way over here. Look at the difference between this connection and this connection. This one has a longer connection length, so those stresses have had more room to propagate. In other words, more of the section is effective, right? Remember, we take net area times U to get the effective net area, right? Make sense? So longer connection length, larger shear lag factor. And look at what the equation does. 1 minus X bar divided by L. That L gets larger and larger, 1 minus X over L gets larger uh, as well. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> now, if you've got a staggered connection, again, exterior bolt to exterior bolt, okay? So just literally the bolt that is all the way over here to the bolt that's all the way over there, however far that uh, distance is, that's your connection length. Sound good? Yes, sir? Is your factor negative? No. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the centroids that we're talking about are, you know, tiny. We're talking about, you know, one to two inches. You, you, you will never have a, uh, uh, a negative uh, connect, uh, uh, shear lag factor. I see what you're saying, that mathematically it's possible, but for that to happen, you would have to have a really, really massive member with an, a little itty bitty connection, and you you never do no no that's you know, mathematically I see what you're talking about, but in terms of applying that to a real world situation, that would never happen. That's a good question though. All right, sound good? Okay. All right. If you've got welded connections, you would take the connection length as just the average length. So, for instance. Uh, you know, if you're talking about, like, if you have a, an angle and it's only welded on, on the longitudinal lens, that's L. If you, even if you've got a transverse weld, that's L. If you have what's called a balanced connection, which we'll do that later on when we talk about welded connections, just take the average. So if this is 2 and that's, you know, 6, then take your length to be 4. And if you're wondering why you do that, well, we place more weld over here because the centroid is closer to this side. 
we do that to try and eliminate as much bending in the angle uh, as possible. So since the centroid is closer to that end, we throw more weld in to try and balance the equilibrium uh, out a little bit. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll get to that later, don't worry. We will design connections like that uh, when it's all said and done. All right, so far so good? Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is slenderness limits. Now, if you are, go back to that shear lag table, okay, if you go back to that shear lag table and go to, uh, go back a page to 16.126, um, you know, read section D.1. What is the maximum slenderness allowed on a tension member? What does it say? There is no maximum slenderness limit for a tension member. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, let me say this. So the code does not specifically require that when designing a tension member that you have a limit on its slenderness. Okay. But practical um, uh, considerations, we should limit the slenderness to some value. And if you read the user note below, we limit the slenderness to 300. Now, let's talk about slenderness. What do we mean by slenderness? Okay. Well. We have L over R, I'll say this, L over R. L is the length of the member, R is the radius of gyration. If you remember from mechanics of deformable bodies, L over R is a slenderness term that um, uh, is used to ultimately compute the buckling capacity of a column. And when we get into columns, when we get into beams later on, slenderness is going to become, I guess, our best friend and maybe our worst enemy all at the same time, but we're going to live in the world of slenderness uh, later on. Right now, we're just going to place uh, a cap of L over R uh, less than or equal to 300 for the purposes of, our, uh, of what we're doing in here, really for, for two reasons. One, it'll help us out uh, in selecting a member. That's point one. And point two, there, there are a number of really practical reasons why you don't want a member that is really, really slender. I mean, yeah, you could probably select a member that will safely resist the loads. It's not going to fail. But the problem is you could have some problems during shipping. You could get damaged during shipping if you have a really, really slender member. The more slender a member is, the harder it is to handle, the harder it is to pick up. I mean, go, go to a fabricator and watch them try and pick up a, a, a piece of steel that's really, really slender. I mean, you, you start talking about like a standard mill plate and you pick it up, it almost looks like a piece of wet spaghetti, you know. So, so trying to pick it up and handle it, you know, move it and have it not, you know, have excessive sag and whatnot, even just during fabrication, it, it's, you know, it's tough to deal with. So limiting L over R to 300 just makes sense from a practicality standpoint, from a user uh, standpoint, and from the customer standpoint. I mean, you, you want your members to have a little bit of beefiness to them just to prevent excessive deflection, excessive vibration, uh, and things like that. Now, when you look up a radius of gyration, a radius of gyration will be in inches, and then a member length will be expressed in feet. So pay attention to your units. Slenderness is unitless, okay? So you need to convert your member length to inches, okay? Your radius of gyration, it's listed as the minimum radius of gyration. So you're going to look up uh, for symmetric shapes like I-beams and channels and things like that. You're going to look up Rx and Ry and take the, uh, the minimum, okay? For angles, there'll be a, a, a minimum when you go off the principal axis, and we'll, we'll get to that as we, uh, as we go forward. Okay, so I've got a nice little pretty summary of equations right here. You might want to put a big star on this slide. You've got the gross section uh, capacity, the net section capacity. You've got the location of the U values, and you've got the net area for bolted connection uh, equations listed right here. Does anybody have any questions on this? Everybody good? All right. Shear lag factor for case two, one minus x bar over L, that's a, um, a very good one or a very important one. And also our slenderness limit. Now we will add to this list later because we'll have equations that we'll use for design. We will have um, uh, block shear rupture expressions and threaded rod design. Threaded rod design is another type of tension member, but it's a pretty straightforward one and you can sort of plug and chug derive an expression that's, that's really easy to, uh, uh, to employ. Everybody good with this? All right, now let's get into it. So I have a, uh, a member. It's a W8 by 24. It's 40 foot long. It's comprised of A992 steel, 
and I'm using three quarter inch diameter bolts. I've got um, the connection layout listed right here. You can see the bolt spacing. Um, we've got, let me ask you this, how many lines of bolts in each flange? Two. And we have how many bolts per line? Let's see if that makes sense. Four. Okay, there we go. All right. So W8 by 24. I want to know um, the, uh, the axial capacity of this section, and I also want to know if it meets recommended slenderness limits. And we'll, we'll expand on this, on this example when we finish to sort of bring it around, you know, for the, uh, the big picture. Everybody good? All right. Now, to do this example, I'm going to need some values. So I'm going to have you all look some stuff up for me. All right. So example four. Now, this is a W, what, 8 by 24? Okay, so I'm going to have you all look up some values for me, all right? Um, let's see. I'm going to have a bunch of different people reporting some values to me, so let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Hampton, what's the gross area? 7.08. All right. Mr. McCracken, what's the flange thickness? Zero point two four five for the flange thickness? Yeah, that's a web probably. Okay. Zero point four, and then it's listed zero zero inches, right? You got that? All right, let's see. Mr. Gunnels, let's get the, uh, the flange width. 6.5. Actually, it's 6.50, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's see. All right, uh, let's see. Ms. Clark, what is going on with the depth? Remember the fractional depth, or not the fractional, the decimal depth, sorry. <laughs> 7.93 inches. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Um, all right, now, we're going to need two R values to make a determination. So let's see. Uh, Mr. Maynard and, let's see, Ms. Bailey. All right. So, Mr. Maynard, tell me what Rx is. And it's going to be on, both of these are going to be on the other side, on the other page. Now you'll notice while you're looking them up, you should be able to follow the 24 over. You'll see the 24 on the other page. So I need, so Mr. Manor, you tell me Rx and then uh, you tell me Ry. There should be, it should say axis like XX and axis YY and then you'll, yeah, you see that? Okay, so what do you got for Rx? 3.42. What do you got? 1.61. And notice those are inches, right? Okay. Is everybody else able to, to follow along with these and find these values? Okay, good with that. Okay, now, all right, we got another set of values we need to look up. A992 steel. Let's see if you all remember where to find that. It's not in that section. It's a little further ahead. You're already there. Tell you what. You're there. Go ahead and tell me what FY and FU are for. Now, keep in mind, you're looking at uh, the rolled shapes. So. Now, let's, let's do a couple things. All right. <coughs> so. What table did you find that in? Table 2-4 on what page? Uh, all right. And then this one was just in table 1-1, right? I think that one's easy to find. Okay. So while everybody's writing this stuff down, I want to see if everybody's found that. So let's see. we got some. Yep, yep. There we go. There we go. 
There you go. There you go. You able to find it? Two forty-eight, not four. The ta it's table two dash four, so you're gonna have to go forward a little bit to right there. There you go. Yeah, you had it tabbed. Yeah. All right. Everybody follow along with me so far, right? Okay. Now, now going off of those slides that we just starred in our in our um, notes. In order to determine the capacity, right now we're just looking at gross section yielding and net section fracture. So help me out. Can we go ahead and compute the gross section yielding capacity right now? Like, tell me, what, what do we need in order to compute the gross section yielding capacity? AG and FY, which we have those, right? Let's just do it. So let's start off with gross section yielding. So. So what we're trying to compute is phi PN, right? So let me, I can do better than that. Phi T PN. So P sub N, that is the nominal capacity. So that's the FYAG, but then we're adjusting it by a safety factor. And what's the safety factor? 0.9. So this is 0.9 FYAG. So that's 0 0.9 times 50 KSI times 7.08 square inches. So before we do any counts, what's, what are the units? Kips. So we're going to get phi PN is so-and-so kips. Three eighteen point six. For this limit state it is. That's a good question. Remember, this limit state, we're just talking about yielding in the growth section. So um, what we're saying is this. If our factored loads exceed 318.6 kips, then yielding is imminent. Okay? Yielding is not as bad of a deal as fracture. So for fracture, if you notice, phi is 0.75. Because if yielding happens, the member just gets a little longer. But if fracture happens, you know, we're talking about it separating. That's a worse condition. Does that answer your question? That is a good question. That's a really good question. Now, to compute gross section or to compute net section fracture, how do we compute net section fracture? We take the um, uh, tensile stress F sub U and we multiply it by the effective net area. So to do effective net area, what do we need? We need net area and what else? Well, we need, yeah, we're going to need area of the holes, but I'm talking about in larger picture. For, for net section fracture, we need the A sub N, but we also need something else. U, yeah, we need the shear lag factors, yeah. Okay, so let's take those one at a time, okay? So let's do, um, let's do net area first. Now we should be experts at net area by now. Now, for net area, let's just sort of walk it through, okay? For net area, the first thing we need is the gross area. But we already have that. We have the 7.08. We also need the, what's going on with the bolt hole. So, so help me out. What's the diameter of the bolt? Three quarters of an inch. So if the bolts are three quarter inch in diameter, how how wide are the holes? Seven eighths. There we go. It's like I've taught y'all something. It's crazy. I'm now more exceedingly conscious that my H's actually look like H's and not M's, since everybody wants to make fun of my handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. 
Um, now help me out with this, okay? Net area equals the gross area minus the area lost due to bolt holes. So if I samurai sword or lightsaber through this section, how many bolt holes am I subtracting? Four, because remember, you're cutting a section through, and we even have sort of the, the cross-sectional image right here, because here we go. It's cutting through the section, one, two, three, four. So the area of a hole is the diameter times the thickness. And what thickness do we use? The point four, the flange thickness. See why we looked that up? Here we go. So we can do this. Go away. So net area equals the gross area minus four times the diameter times the thickness. Remember, we're not adding any stagger factors because there's no staggered failure paths, right? There's, there's nothing, there's, it's all grid-like. If there was, we'd have to go through and check them all. But. All right, so 7.08 square inches minus four times seven-eighths of an inch times a flange thickness of 0 0.4 inches. So what is our net area? Say it again. 5.68. Do I have a second on that? There we go. All right. Okay. Everybody good so far? Any questions? Okay. So that's our net area. Okay. Now we need our shear lag factors. This is the new stuff. Okay. Does everybody have what, everything on this panel before I move on? Okay. Uh, so four, right? Okay. So shear lag factors. Or U. Okay. So shear lag factors. Okay. So let's go through that table. And let's list all of the cases that could apply. So remember, we're on 16.1-28. Let's look at the cases that apply. What's that? Well, case 7 applies. Does any other apply? Case 2, because we have the flanges connected, but not the web. Okay? Everybody all right with that? All right. So we have cases... Two and seven. Okay, so let's let's just do it numerically. Let's start off with case two. All right. So to compute the shear lag factor for case two, we'll call it U sub two. That is one minus x bar connection divided by the length of the connection. Right. Let's take them one at a time. How long is the connection? What is the length of the connection for this problem going to be? So say it again. No, 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 that's the length of the member. I'm talking about the length of the connection. And what what somebody else say? Nine inches, right? Because going off of the uh, the connection region, remember, length of the connection is literally from outermost bolt to outermost bolt. So, you know, here's our image. We're talking about from outside to outside. So three, six, nine. Sound good? That 2 does not go into it, so it's not 11, it's just 9, from outer bolt to outer bolt. Is that my alarm to hurry up? Is that what it is? <laughs> Length of the connection is 9 inches. Now, for our X bar, this is a unique one, okay? So this is, so help me out with this. We have a wide flange section that is connected via the flanges, okay? So I need the X-bar connection for a W8 by 24. So tell me what to do. If I have a W section and it's connected via the flanges, remember, a WT, okay. Now, let's, let's see if I remember. Let's ask two questions. What property am I looking up for the WT? Is it the flange thickness? Is it 
Not, okay, it's not X bar, remember. Y bar, there we go, there we go. Because we're going from the top down. So that's why we're looking up Y bar. Now, it's a Y bar for what cross section? It's a WT what? Well, the 12 is the weight. There we go, four by 12. So help me out. What is the Y bar for a WT four by 12? 0 0.695. Do I got a second on that? Yes. All right. Now, before I move on, is everybody able to find that? So what's the table number? Like, what is it? It's table what? Table 1-8. All right. Everybody good? Everybody good? I see most people are pretty much on it, so. Okay. All right. So, let's see, so therefore, U2 is 1 minus 0 0.695 over 9 inches. So what does that come out to be? So maybe the three decimals will say 0 0.923, something like that. Remember, when we look up that dimension, we're looking up this, the distance from here to here, where that's sort of where the centroid is. So that's why we're looking up Y bar. Okay. Sound good? All right. We still got a couple minutes. I think we can knock this out. Okay. So... That's case two. What was the other case? Case seven, right? Now, um, help me out. What are we going to need for case two versus case, or for case seven? What are we going to need to look at? First off, are, for case seven, are we looking at that upper set of limits or that lower set of limits? Upper. 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 It says with the flange connected with three or more fasteners per line. Do we have three or more fasteners per line? We have four per line, so we are good there. So in order to assess this limit, what are we going to need? We're going to need two quantities, right? We're going to need what, B sub F? Okay, so what is B sub F? All right, what else are we going to need? Two-thirds of the depth. So that's two-thirds of what? 7.93. So what do we got? Let's say 5. Point what? No, okay. That's fine. No, that's fine. 5.29. I got a second on that? There we go. All right. So Here's our two values. Help me out. If I have B sub F over on this side and I have two-thirds D on this side, is it greater than, less than, what is it? Greater than. And if the flange width is greater than two-thirds of the depth, what is U? U is 0.9. Sound good? Now, which one do we use? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. First off, I got a mistake. It's not U2 is 0 0.923 inches. It's just 0 0.923. That's a mistake. Which value do I use, the U2 or the U7? Say, you, well, that's a good question. Now, read the bottom of case 7 uh, on the left side. What does it say? Exactly. If you use case 2, then you use the larger value. So therefore, U is 0 0.923. And again, it's, it's all trying to represent that experimental data. You know, going down to the lab and ripping apart hundreds of different steel shapes and finding out which equation best represents that data. So I know, it, you know, that engineer's gut feeling tells you to go with the smaller number and be conservative, but it's not accurately representing what's really going on. 
Well, what, are you asking, hold on, are you saying, will case two always be larger? No, you just always go with whatever the larger is. If you're calculating with case two and case seven. You see what I mean? Look at case eight. Yeah, so case eight, and that's for angles. So, well, I don't want to use always as a nevers because there's situations with HSS and, and things like that. So, how about this? You're just wanting the, the be all simple answer to put on your formula sheet for, for the test. So, what I'm saying is go through and read the manual and go through the spec. All right, let's sort of knock out uh, uh, the, the net section fracture capacity real quick, and then we'll call it. We'll, we'll handle the slenderness later. So net section fracture. Okay, net section fracture. How do I compute that? We're calculating another fee PN, but tell me what to do. It's in that slide. Yep, some, the fee is 0.75. There you go. All right, now remember, we're taking our tensile stress, multiplying it by our net area, and multiplying it by our shear lag factors. Hi. All right, so 0 0.75 times FU, which is... Making y'all go back. There we go. 65 KSI. All right. Net area is 5. What? 5.68. And what's our shear lag factor? 0 0.923. Engineers don't use always as a nevers, so you ought to know that. Now, what does that come out to be? Okay, so 255 point, we'll say 6. Fair point? Now, before we leave, real quick, and we'll, we'll document this next time, let me ask you a question. If you were trying to express how strong this member is, would you say 255.6 or would you use the gross section yielding and say 318.6? Who says 255? Good. It's a 255 because think, if I'm yanking on it and I'm increasing the load, what happens first? I'm going to hit this number first before I hit the 318. And under, in other words, based on this connection, based on the bolts that are used and the size of the member and et cetera, fracture is going to what we call govern the design. It's going to fracture before it yields. Yes, sir? What? <laughs> because what I'm getting at is that, look at this. This is how much force it takes to fracture it, 255.6. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. But look at the areas. What's the net area and what's the gross area? No, no, I mean, think, think about it. I mean, here's our net area. See, I wouldn't use that terminology, but... <laughs> Here's our net area, 5.68. That's the area around the connection. That's the area in the gross body of the member. You see what I mean? The seven point. It's less area. All right, we got folks from Concrete trickling in, so I'm going to call it for now. We will pick this part up next time and take and tackle our slenderness limits later. Sound good? All right. All right. Yeah, I know. Everybody was so excited about steel, so.